so I, I can't help but, but um, take a tiny liberty in responding to Walter's thanks to all the people that he worked with and thanks to the Navy and thanks to his colleagues and his students and all the loves of his life. I really think it's all of us that have thanks to give. I know I speak from everybody. I'm so grateful that all of us are so grateful that we've had the opportunity to work with you. You're the one that deserves the thanks. So we'll carry on um, with uh, our acoustic session and uh, Kelly Benoit Bird is gonna talk to us about that. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much to Peter and Bruce for inviting me here. It's quite an honor for a relative greenhorn like me to be asked to participate with this um, list of names. So I hope I can do Walter some justice. Uh, fairly early in my independent research career, I had the opportunity to uh, participate in the Oceano Oceanography 2025 workshop, where we were tasked to look ahead um, a couple of decades about where we might be in oceanography. And I had the privilege of being in several working groups with Walter where he uh, challenged me to think both more simply and more grandly, and I think the charge we were all given here today to talk about oceanography in the next 100 years gives you a sense of how much grander he wants all of us to be thinking. But one of the things that inspired me most about our conversation was how clear it was that his work was driven by the question rather than being restricted by the tools available. I, you've heard today about how Walter's entry into the field of acoustics was a great example of that, inspired by the recognition that mesoscale processes were playing an important role in ocean dynamics, and yet ships, and as we heard from Peter's talk, even more modern technologies, were woefully undersampling these processes. Now this is a view of uh, the ocean surface from space, where you can see the huge range of spatial scales that we have dynamics happening off the east coast here in the United States. And in this example, the indicator that we can see these processes by is in fact the plant activity. And it's an interesting problem that these, uh, we're seeing these associations between the biology and the physics, and that the biology often is a useful cue for us to track physical processes. And I want to step back a bit and point out how different this is from our perception as terrestrial animals, where the physical processes happen over much uh, more rapid time scales and over much smaller spatial scales than the biological ones. However, in marine systems, we see really tight coupling in the scales between biology and physical processes. Um, you see that great overlap in those scales. And as a consequence, we need to think very carefully about the interaction of physics and biology at sea. Now, we've known about the heterogeneity of life in the ocean since the first biological oceanographers dipped nets, um, beginning with Henson in the late 1890s. But mostly, this has been treated as a problem of error. Acoustics has given us a really different view of the heterogeneity than we would see from um, either nets or surface observations, for example, of large animals. And scattering layers are a really key example of that contribution. In fact, the name alone gives you a clue that they were discovered largely using acoustic techniques and were in fact thought um, initially to be related to geology rather than biology. But when they started to discover diel patterns in that, we all know that's not a geologic time scale. So these features can extend um, tens, even hundreds of kilometers, but are vertically compressed um, and represent large aggregations of biomass that, as I mentioned, move up and down in the water column each day. We've also used acoustics to describe spatial processes in the biology at much smaller scales. This is data from a 120 kilohertz echo sounder in the Bering Sea. And as you can see the bottom there at just over 150 meters, in the water column we have these strikingly intense aggregations of very high intensity scattering from aggregations of krill. And you either hit one of those patches of krill or you don't. These are remarkable swarms and when you see them visually, it's amazing how much of a krill soup this really is. And so we wanted to use this kind of information to start asking questions about why is this variability here? Obviously, it's partly the physics, but also what consequences does this have in the ecosystem? And so here is a map of the southeastern Bering Sea uh, with the Pribilof Islands there noted in the center in white. And the more um, intense colors in red represent higher aggregation, so uh, higher local density, not higher average density. 
And this gives us one perspective on the Bering Sea that is in fact quite different from our more traditional view of just how many krill are out there, something we might do for a stock assessment. And when we started to ask using a variety of techniques, including predator track, tagging, acoustic tracking of these animals and other things was that for all of the predators that utilize these resources that are a variety, have a variety of different foraging and breeding strategies, how aggregated the krill were was much more important to their success than how many krill there were. And that turns out to be really important in solving a paradox proposed uh, by Lasker in experimental work here in the 1970s, where when you feed um, schooling fish, the average concentrations of food measured in the ocean, they all die. So animals cannot survive in the, on the average food concentrations in the ocean. Why are we measuring them? They in fact do not survive on those average food concentrations. It's the variance that turns out to be really important. Another way of putting this is that predators target prey based on its distribution or, and not on its biomass. But most of this work has been done in the relative surface ocean, using uh, work obviously from satellites where we get a very, very narrow view of the ocean, and even from shipboard acoustics where we perhaps get hundreds of meters. And we've long thought about the deep sea as uniform and slow, both from a physical and a biological perspective. However, there are a large number of obligate air breathers that, uh, including toothed whales and seals, that have evolved physiological and behavioral characteristics to feed at depths of 1,000 meters or more. If they need aggregated resources to be successful and the deep ocean is uniform and slow, we have a paradox again to resolve. I think it's clear that the repeated appearance of this physiologically challenging and energetically costly strategy um, indicates that there may be more going on in the deep sea. <clears throat> Um, so today I'm going to talk a bit about uh, deep diving beaked whales. I have a, a dive depth here noted to three kilometers, but there are now measurements over four kilometers deep for some of these animals. So these are really remarkable um, animals in terms of their, their depth for foraging. Despite the fact that they're a large mammal, we know very little about them. There are about 20 species, and in the course of my career, I think four new species have been identified, which is pretty remarkable when you think about a large mammal being um, undiscovered less than a decade ago. We know that most of these animals suction feed on deep water squid, and one of the challenges for us is that they appear to be particularly sensitive to anthropogenic sound sources. Um, as you can see in that lower right image, there have been large, relatively large numbers of incidents of strandings of animals in association with operational military sonars, particularly the mid-frequency anti-submarine warfare signals. And, we've, uh, and more commonly, these animals are observed um, to show sublethal avoidance, leaving areas where there are high um, acoustic activities like ASW signals. And we really wanted to know what role their food resources could be playing in this kind of uh, both lethal and sublethal impact. And so today I'm going to tell you a story of two Navy ranges, the Score Range off Southern California and the Autec Range off the Bahamas. These are two very different ecosystems. One's relatively um, energy rich, and though, of course, Autec being in the tropics is a blue water ecosystem. These are, uh, have resident beaked whales are two different species. Uh, off Southern California, we have a much larger um, individual, the, the Cuvier's beaked whales. Where at Autec, we have much smaller, up to 1,000 uh, kilogram animals. And our goal in comparing these was to try to figure out what factors about the habitat and their resources might really be important. If there was a convergence of the answers of these, that might point us in the right direction. Whereas it's sometimes really easy to get caught up in the story of a single site um, and over explain um, that particular system without really understanding the mechanisms. The great advantage of working in these areas, obviously, is uh, that these animals have huge interactions, really repeated and frequent ones with the US Navy. But from a scientific perspective, these sites are instrumented with a large number of seafloor-mounted hydrophones. And so they can have, in fact, done long time series of how animals use these habitats for foraging based on the sounds that they make um, that indicate foraging activity. And so these are two maps of the habitat use of these animals during our um, experiments. 
And what you can see is that they don't use these areas equally. Particularly noticeable here at SCORE, they use the northwest quadrant of the range much more frequently for foraging than they use the northeast quadrant, and each of those boxes is about 25 kilometers across. And so we have this high level of sub-mesoscale variability in their behavior that may indicate that there are some interesting processes happening in their food as well. We see some similar patterns uh, at Autec, although not nearly as striking a contrast between high and low use um, habitats for these two animals. And I will say that from an oceanographic perspective, these areas don't look that different. Um, and, and we made lots of measurements through these and tried to understand what might be happening from a physical perspective. Um, there's clearly a lot more going on uh, that we don't understand. The challenge, however, is that these beaked whales um, are feeding so deep. Our ship-based acoustic measurements uh, looking for squid get us a range of up to about 600 meters, and these animals are typically feeding around 1,000 to 1,200 meters. And so we have a methodological problem, and um, um, learning from Walter that that should never stop you, we started to think a little more creatively about how we might access this habitat where the beaked whales are feeding and use the same instruments that we would use in a ship-based system um, in an autonomous underwater vehicle capable of diving to a depth of 600 meters. And suddenly that puts the squid and the beaked whales within our depth horizon. And so just for a sense of scale, this is what that autonomous platform looked like. Um, when we were developing this, this was about a quarter of the size of um, any other AUV had, that had been implemented with um, scientific echo sounders to date, and was possible to deploy it from relatively small research vessels, like in this case, the New Horizon. Um, and you notice that bulging section there in the front that looks like this remiss is actually pregnant. And if you look at it from the underside, you'll see that that's the location of a seven degree uh, split beam 38 kilohertz transducer. And right behind that is a 120 kilohertz transducer. The electronics for this system are in the section immediately behind it. Um, and we had to do a lot of work to make what is meant to be a, a human interactive system work robustly in an autonomous setting. And I just want to, um, I won't talk about these data today, but one of the exciting things we were able to do was process the data on board and look for squid um, inside the vehicle so that the vehicle could make real-time decisions about the scale of sampling, uh, giving us more data in areas where there was more interesting things to see. Now, we chose those two frequencies um, very carefully, partially within the limits of the physical constraints, although you can see we weren't very limited by that, um, uh, despite the manufacturer thinking we were nuts for wanting to put a transducer that was twice the diameter of the vehicle inside it. It's possible. Um, but also in thinking about the frequency response of the echoes that we would get back from the animals in the habitat and really wanting to get at squid specifically. And so this is a plot of the relative target strength, so all normalized to individual maxima. From the typical fisheries acoustics frequencies um, here from 38 to 200 kilohertz. Now, both whales and fish with air-filled body parts give us a relatively flat frequency response across this range, as we're typically past the resonance of those um, air-filled cavities. If we're looking at an invertebrate here represented by a krill, um, we typically see a, an increase in frequencies to a certain point and then a leveling out, depending on their size relative to the wavelength. But interestingly, for, for squid, we get a really different response. We get a dramatic drop off in the intensity of the echoes um, that stays consistently flat after that point. So we have this really strong low frequency response. And I'll point out that we don't yet understand the physical underpinnings of this, and it's not predicted by any of the existing scattering models. So we're clearly missing something in the uh, uh, physiology of this animal. But in any case, it proves to be a really useful tool. And with just the two frequencies we were able to fit inside this autonomous platform, we can distinctly identify squid. Uh, and separate these groups largely. And in many cases, we can make estimates of the length of these individuals, which is um, really important for understanding the energetic gains animals might have foraging in this habitat. And so I'm going to fly through the, the, the um, variables that we included in trying to understand this quickly, just to give you a sense of how uh, comprehensive we attempted to be. First, we looked at the total biomass, um, a, a proxy for it anyway, in acoustic sense. Um, thinking very uh, in a sort of more general historical way about these data. We also looked for the abundance of individually resolvable large targets, the abundance of squid in particular, and interest, an interesting variable here, how many of the 
individual large things we saw were actually squid. And this is important from a predator perspective because it's how much clutter do you have to deal with in making a decision and can have a big impact on your ability to accurately find your key prey. We also looked at the spatial structure of squid and the size of these squid. And we made these calculations over a variety of different depth ranges defined both from uh, the physical environment as well as what we know from tagging studies of uh, the depths that these animals are using at a range of different horizontal scales and looking for variability in these, how much vertical structure do we see? And I want to just highlight some of the key um, imp imp and important things we saw when looking at the areas that beaked whales preferred at both SCORE and at AWTEC. At both sites, the proportion of squid um, of the, uh, in the large targets was significantly higher in areas that beaked whales prefer. And this gets, um, is really well modeled in predator foraging studies that if you have um, more of the right prey relative to the less one, you make better decisions and it is less costly from a cognitive perspective. When we looked at the average density of squid at SCORE, we found that it was substantially higher in the preferred habitats, but at AWTEC it was not. And I think this is a really important finding because it, it um, appears again, even in the deep sea, that there is, uh, it, these predators are not being driven solely by the biomass. When we look at the distribution of prey in the preferred versus the less preferred areas, we see the most striking differences. At both SCORE and at AWTEC, the squid in the preferred habitat were clustered in 10 to 100 meter scale patches that depending on where you were could be uh, 400 meters apart or perhaps a kilometer if you're at SCORE. Well, in the less preferred areas, they tended to be close to a random distribution. And what that means is that the mode spacing between one squid and the next, while you're diving a half a mile deep in the ocean is substantially less in those areas where they're foraging. Perhaps not surprisingly, you're not going to come back up to the surface to take a breath between each and every prey. And so you have the chance of capturing many more prey if they're 50 meters apart than you do if they're three kilometers apart on each one of those dives to the deep sea. The other interesting difference is that the squid in the preferred areas also tended to be significantly larger. This is a, a difference measured in terms of length. But these squid tend to grow allometrically, meaning they get fatter as they get longer. And so the calorie gains may be even more substantial than this um, percent difference. Now, I want to put the data from one of these sites into a biological context just so that you can kind of understand what these metrics might mean. And so comparing the high use relative to the low use sites here off Southern California, we see that difference in spacing and the high use areas where squid are clustered together and with large spaces between them. If you find one squid, you're likely to find another within 50 meters. However, in the low use site, it's going to be three kilometers before you reach that next squid. We know from tagging studies that each one of these dives, um, beaked whales attempt to capture about 30 prey. So to do that, at the high use site, you'd have to swim about a meter per second to encounter 30 individuals. However, at the low use site, you better turn on your turbos because you'd have to go 50 meters per second, more than 110 miles per hour. Um, in order to e even encounter that any. And of course, we know from tagging studies that their maximum velocity of the animals here is about 10 meters per second, with a sustained speed substantially slower than that. So there's no way that they can even encounter that many squid in that low, less preferred habitat. This doesn't incorporate the size differences, which will obviously amplify some of these effects, where the average length of squid in the high use um, habitat has a mantle length of 22 centimeters. We always measure squid by the parts that are um, not too stretchy. And so you can just about double that to get a full length, just to give you some perspective. Where in the low use habitat, they were on the order of 16 centimeters. So we can convert this into calories and ask how many dives would an individual beaked whale have to do in order to meet its basic energetic needs? Ignoring the costs of accessing the prey and reproduction and growth and all those things that are important for uh, population stability, in the high use area, the animals would have to do about a dive a day. They have a lot of surplus available there. However, in the low use habitat, even if they could e eat every single squid they encountered, they'd have to make 84 dives half a mile deep or more in the ocean just to get a, a basic um, need. And that, of course, doesn't account for how costly those 84 dives would be. And from tagging um, work by some collaborators, we know that they at most do 12 dives in a given day. So clearly, um, it does make a lot of sense to be in that low use habitat, but it's pretty clear why these animals are in this high use habitat repeatedly. 
But one of our other questions was, why the heck do they keep coming back when they are disturbed on average about a third of the time by um, Navy activities? So we looked at adjacent areas where these animals retreat to um, when anti-submarine warfare training in particular is happening on the range and asked these same kinds of questions. And what we found was that those off-range refuges are um, richer in food than the area on the range that they don't prefer, but it's really slicing this fine. They would have to do 12 dives a day, again, not accounting for the costs of all of that, or any growth to reproduction in order just to make a living. And so clearly there's not enough left over there. And helps explain why these animals continue to return to these ranges despite these um, high level of disturbance. Um, so the, I want to say first that the presence of this biological heterogeneity at scales of 100 meters and smaller um, really contributes to the increasing evidence of our, that our view of the deep sea is vastly oversimplified. Uh, these observations of resource structure at these scales also provide a framework for how we have to study and interpret the behavior of these deep diving predators. But getting back to the question I asked at the beginning is what role does food play? Well, the distribution of food, and I highlight that there, the distribution of food plays a vital role in driving the observed distribution of these animals over relatively long time scales that have been observed. The persistent use of the range, despite that repeated disturbance, and it determines the cost of the relocation um, for these animals in terms of range activity. And we're working with the Navy now to incorporate these, these into their population level models to try to predict how we might best use the range resources in order to have the least impact on these animals. For example, does it make more sense to cluster your activities into a shorter time period or to space them out in a certain pattern to allow these animals access to their food? Um, uh, and, and are there certain times of the year where you might have less of an impact? So across these systems, from the surface to the deep sea, from uh, high latitudes to low, we're finding that aggregated resources are absolutely critical to animal survival in the ocean. A corollary to that, of course, is that we have to understand that distribution of resources for effective management of populations, and that includes the beaked whale example I just showed you, but also our management of fisheries, because fishers also exploit these heavily aggregated resources, and it affects their competition with other animals in the habitat. Um, Walter famously um, described waves as moderately confused phenomena, and some of you will recognize this. He said they're not as predictable as a sine wave, but not highly chaotic. So you could predict them if you had moderate skill. I think most physical oceanographers largely view biology as completely chaotic and unpredictable. <laughs> but I'd like to think that using acoustics, we're starting to be able to apply this definition to biology as well. When we're able to recognize what's the signal and what's the noise, in this case, um, the, the data that people have often kind of uh, attributed to the error bar is in fact the most important signal, that variability. And we have to really understand mechanisms if we are to make useful predictions. And um, acoustics has really played a key role in helping us make that uh, transition for understanding ecology in the ocean. I've given you some examples today from um, behavioral ecology and predator-prey interaction, as well as our description of interaction webs. But acoustics has also contributed a great deal to other um, information as well, including uh, biogeochemistry, biophysical interactions, and climate science. So really, um, active acoustics in studying life in the ocean has, has made a, a lot of contribution to how does the ocean work and why. And I think that may be a very different question than many of you think about using active acoustics in the ocean, um, which has really been used historically to address how many fish are in the ocean. And is it a redfish or a bluefish? And I would like to say that we've gotten better at that particular problem, but we still have a long way to go in the classification realm. But I think um, through careful interpretation of data, we've made a lot of progress in the questions on the right. And I want to, as we think about moving towards the future, look a little bit towards the past and assess how much in flux our community is in, a, in moving from that question on the right in, in Seuss land to a, a grander scale question there on the right. And so this plot is going to show you um, the uh, importance of ecological acoustics. That is, 
talks given on uh, non-commercial species or looking at more than a single species, perhaps looking at an animal in the context of its environment or um, other individuals. Uh, for the ICES meeting, and I won't even use a title for it because it is so quickly changing, that happens about once every five to seven years. And in the first years of the meeting, um, you can see essential, uh, very close to zero of the talks had, were on anything that was non-commercial or on anything that included additional species. Some of you in the room may recognize that small but non-zero value there as uh, uh, San Diego legend Van Holiday and his group. Um, he was, as always, far ahead of his time. But that view has been dramatically shifting over managing and measuring only stocks that we as humans care about to thinking much more broadly about the ocean system. Putting those animals that we do still care about from a human perspective into the context of their environment, including other animals. In this last meeting, um, uh, just a couple of years ago, almost 75% of the talks were really about the ecosystem and not about the single fish. And I think that's a really important shift in the kinds of questions we're asking and even um, merited a change in the name of the symposium from fisheries acoustics to marine ecosystem acoustics. And this uh, uh, exponential change is, I think, really pointing the way towards the future. There are also some other changes. We've kind of historically gone out and done our echo sounding with a single frequency or a few single frequencies from a ship. For the first time, commercially available uh, scientific systems are available that allow us to do broadband measurements. We haven't quite grappled with what that's going to mean for the classification problem and others. Um, and I think that'll be where a lot of us spend our time um, in the near future. We're also, of course, experiencing the revolution in oceanography towards um, mobile autonomous platforms to getting instruments out in long periods of time and in new ways. And as a field, we're thinking much more broadly about the kinds of animals that these techniques can be applied to and thinking about them all simultaneously rather than just as separate components. Um, and I think that's uh, really important as we think about where we're going um, in terms of making a contribution to some of the, the needs we have as we face a dramatically changing system. Now, the, the level of integration that it will take to build ecological theory um, for the Earth system is really at the edge of science as we know it. Um, and it but it's clear that acoustics will play an important role uh, with the new instrumentation that's currently becoming available, the new platforms um, that we're continuing to exploit, the integration with other tools beyond acoustics, including things like optics and imaging, as well as physical oceanography. But I think one of the grand challenges we face is making progress in analyzing and visualizing the voluminous information necessary for addressing these critical questions in ecosystems, um, but that are, at some level, incredibly overwhelming. Uh, we're also thinking very carefully about how we take this data and use it to um, facilitate real-time capabilities for better sampling, making feedback loops between acoustics and other sensors, um, and taking a really integrated perspective perspective on data acquisition, analysis, and interpretation to, make, to address ecological um, questions in the ocean. So these ongoing changes prevent, provide a great opportunity, um, but we should also not be restricted by them. As we learned from Walter, it's not just about the tools, it's about the key questions we ask, and sometimes asking them in the simplest ways. So with that, I would like to say thank you um, to Walter for having such an influence on me as I started to think about both my future and the future of our field, and thank you all for giving me time to talk to you today. passive acoustic side, so that plot really only includes the active acoustic component, though I would argue that those kind of moved in parallel in a lot of ways, so yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, well, that's the, where that data came from, is from the passive acoustic detections. Uh, so that all, data is all going through a collaborator at the Naval Undersea Warfare Center. I think one of the exciting things is that they're um, going to be giving us access to the bi-directional nodes on that, um, and we're going to attempt to use those as uh, at least qualitative uh, time series data on the range where we can try to look at the volume reverberation over time, um, which I think won't, it won't give us the same kinds of data that we obviously can get from the, the echo sounders, but it may help us refine what times and places we have variability that we need to go measure better. Yes, thanks. We have, and like I said, that is in this one of these plots. Uh, if I can operate a Mac, I apologize for my my PC bias. But here, this, these are data from the Autech range, um, smoothed into a map so that you can you can take a look at that. And these just represent the time period that we were out there to sort of validate our a priori assumptions. But we were letting the animals tell us where to go. Um, both using the long-term data and using the real-time information we are getting from the range. So, so I have a question about that. Um, it's, it's it's somewhat easy to understand why the the whales always appear where the squid appear. The question, one question I would ask is why the squid there? That's a fantastic mm -hmm. question, and we haven't gotten to that part yet. Got to start somewhere. Maybe a symposium. <laughs> Absolutely, and and it's, what's interesting is that this is not reflected in the biology that we see in the upper 600 meters of the water column. In fact. Um, at Autech, there are very few correlations with these locational differences, and at SCORE, the pattern is backwards. So you find many more um, small things that might serve as food for squid in the low-use site in the upper 600. So we were hoping we'd develop some proxies that could be more easily sampled and didn't have any luck with that. But One more. What is the uh, acoustic frequency range that the deep whales use for echolocation of their prey? Um, these animals are primarily using between 30 and 40 kilohertz, perhaps unsurprisingly, yeah, given the frequency response that we've measured from squid. So they're really well tuned to that, and it's a really similar frequency range that other squid eaters use as well. So, again, they always tell us the answer. We just have to learn to listen. Last one. Well, further offshore, we see an enormous amount of migration in the squid when come to the surface of the Yes, yeah, so these um, these whales show no diel pattern in their vertical distribution at all. We did not observe a diel movement in the deep these deep water squid that they're foraging on. So that vertical movement is happening on much smaller individuals and not the ones that they're focusing on for food. Uh, in fact, that turns out to be a really useful um, sort of experimental thing because the, all this clutter goes to the surface and we can ignore it and we know that's not what they're eating because they're still diving so deeply. So that's helped us separate what's um, prey and what's just out there. But okay. Let's switch. Thanks. Thanks. So the la last talk before lunch is um, John Colosi from the Postgraduate School on, on, on small, small and microscale scale. acoustics. <laughs> So there, there have been several, a few uh, comments about getting older and sort of remind me of a pithy Woody Allen quote where he says that, uh, I'm not afraid of death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> so, but what I'd like to talk about today is uh, work that, of course, Walter has been uh, intimately involved with and in looking at acoustics at the small scale, small meaning internal waves, uh, but also some ideas about doing some things in microscale that was sort of a, a uh, brainchild of, of the previous symposium that we had here. So, but before I get along, get on with that, I just want to thank Walter and Mary. Mary stepped out. I thank you, Walter, for all the wonderful hospitality you've extended to my family and me uh, with many great visits to your home and surfing down the canyon here and then this crazy wildlife uh, this rattlesnake here in the swash zone at Black's Beach that I almost stepped on. <laughs> Uh, so lots of wildlife and beautiful things to see there. And I must say also to another aspect of Walter and Mary's hospitality is their generous access to the wine cellar. And as all of us know, their taste in wine, I wouldn't say is the highest, but their friends do have an extremely good taste in wine. <laughs> so, and we've had wonderful travel companionship too. Uh, 
at many, many conferences around the world and around the, the country. Here are a few at the Acoustical Society in Honolulu, some recent ones, Ocean Science in New Orleans. And we've also had wonderful collaborations on, on science together. We have, there were the ATOC years where I started as a postdoc with Peter and Walter, lots of discussions about mode statistics and scattering of these basin scales. So Walter had this really cute little diffusive idea about how the modes would get scattered and how the energy would kind of redistribute itself for these very, very long ranges. And so it, when you do a, a transmission loss calculation for the different mode numbers here, we use in climatology, you see something like these squares. When you do the measurement at, at megameter ranges, you see these circles here. And then Andre Morozov and I worked out the, the exact theory and we found that instead of a diffusive behavior, you actually get an exponential change in the mode intensities with range. So instead of going as the square root of R, and our theory agreed beautifully with the measurements the, from the ATOC years. And then we also worked on the, the, the famous tidal cusp problem, and I guess that's sort of a stochastic inverse in some senses. Five equations and five unknowns for the amplitude and phase of the bare tropic tide, the amplitude and phase of the bare clinic tide, and a phase modulation factor. And a really interesting result we saw, this record going back to the mon Hawaiian monarchy showed the phase of the uh, bare clinic tide advancing over the century in response to the, the warming of the thermocline uh, around the Hawaiian waters. So lots of fun things that, that we did there too. But uh, getting back to the, the matter at hand now, you know, Walter's always proud of saying that, you know, the mesoscale revolution is the thing that brought him into acoustics. But we all know the reality is that it's internal ways that brought him into the problem of acoustics. And, and that's where he really set the field on its feet and allowed a lot of us to kind of work from there. Uh, now, Walter is, is definitely uh, concerned with the sampling problem in oceanography that always stands out. Uh, but I would say the sampling problem for internal waves and ocean mixing is almost mo more onerous than the mesoscale sampling problem. Uh, lots of different space and time scales involved in understanding those, those, uh, those phenomena. And so I think maybe we, acoustics can say something about those things. So let's just start with uh, internal waves. And the catalyst was, of course, the GM spectrum from this really interesting measurement that if you put two thermometers or two current meters 100 meters apart from each other in the vertical, their fluctuations were incoherent. And this is one of those interesting cases where people were making measurements, especially with the current meter, uh, Ekman in particular, did not believe his measurements because he thought that there's absolutely no way these measurements can be incoherent over 100 meters vertically. And he never really published the, the result. I don't think Walter said it, it, yeah, it kind of languished in his laboratory. But when finally, you know, the, the understanding of internal waves emerged, uh, that, was, uh, that was really the reality of the ocean. And so we have this famous paper that some of us have, have powered through. Not an easy read for sure. You know, strange notation, why is the vertical coordinate? You know, this, uh, lots of really insightful WKB results. And, and this really put the ocean fine structure sound speed uh, field into perspective. Previous uses were, were basically looking at turbulent type of media. So th with the GM spectrum in hand, why not apply it to, to an acoustic problem? And so this is another nice JSON work that came about. I don't know if the GM spectrum was JSON, <laughs> maybe a little bit, or, but the acoustics part for sure was. So this is part of a 1974 JSON summer study. And the key paper is Munk and Zacharias in 1976, utilizing the Born and Ritov approximation. And what's really interesting is while the sophistication of other methods uh, has increased, we use moment equations, Feynman path integrals, but it basically comes down to the physical picture of the Garrett Munk, or of, the, of the Munk and Zacharias in view. That's at least before uh, ray instability sets in, a ray chaos in which this ray path that we expand around is, becomes un, sufficiently unstable that the, that the solutions are, are, not, are not good enough. But 
This, uh, this is the paper that really le uh, put, led the way. Again, a difficult read, 125 equations. They actually stopped labeling the equations after a while in the paper. I, I noticed the same thing in the GM. <laughs> Just, it was getting a little too out of hand. Uh, but, and key in terms of this talk is this, uh, this discovery of the perpendicular wave number resonance. And that is, this tells us that an acoustical measure of the internal wave field really selects out particular wave numbers of the internal wave field. It doesn't take all of them together. It's, 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 it selects them out, and because of the, dispers the dispersion relation, that also gives us particular frequencies that, that come into the play. Now, the tomography problem, we've heard about Peter Wooster's thesis, and that really was seemed to be, at least in my read, the seed of thinking about doing an acoustical measurement of, of internal waves, uh, where Peter measured the, the very rapid fluctuations uh, in acoustic signals sent over a reciprocal path. And so in this way, you could measure both the displacement of the wave and the current uh, using these reciprocal transmissions. And so another very difficult paper with lots of equations. This is what Walter says in the beginning, the formalism required for the interpretation of the non-reciprocity is regrettably complex. <laughs> <laughs> and Walter, I think you'll be happy to know, I think I've solved a lot of that complexity problem. It turns out that that horrible cusp that you put at the uh, inertial period for the current spectrum is the, thing, is the cause of all those singularities in those equations. If you just do a pure power law, instead of putting the cusp in, which doesn't really mean anything anyway, because it's the inertial period, all the, signal, all the singularities go away, and it's a beautiful, the, the result with the momentum flux uh, comes out beautifully. So, uh, so, so this is the, the direction I think would be really fantastic to go in, to try to make this measurement of the momentum flux and other aspects of the, uh, the internal wave field uh, from this paper. Uh, unfortunately, Walter, it's not your most popular paper. I was looking at the citation rate on it. And <laughs> but maybe we can resurrect that a little bit. Uh, and just sort of lastly, you know, the physics too here is really quite simple. Yeah, there's a lot of complicated wave propagation and moving media uh, theory. But in, in this very, with these very small currents, the, uh, the physics is simple in the sense that to first order in Mach number, an opposing current looks like a, a cold patch of, of ocean. So it essentially just slows the wave down. It's a, it's a correction to the index of refraction. And so you can really add in the, the current effect really quite easily here. Uh, and, and it's really quite elegant. So again, this was another Jason work that, that came about. So why the interest in internal waves? So there was a whole symposium in the spring on this, on this topic. So we'll just kind of run through this really quickly. You know, it's an important pathway of energy transfer and other quantities from large to small scale, linking 2D motions of the large scale to the 3D motions at smaller scale. Mixing and breaking uh, has lots of implications for dynamics and climatological processes. The tidal dissipation problem in the Earth-Moon system. And then the divergences in the internal wave momentum fluxes uh, give rise to stresses on the large scale flow, because uh, internal waves are kind of radiating rather than diffusing momentum. So there's lots of, lots of reasons why we'd like to learn a little bit more about the internal wave field at, through maybe the acoustical lens. And this is a statement I've gone, gone back to kind of over and over again to see uh, whether we've really come a long, or a, a, a long ways in understanding the internal wave problem, at least in terms of the, the shape of the spectrum. And I think at the symposium last spring, Carl gave an overview of the internal waves. And I think we maybe haven't quite gotten very far. And it's kind of embodied in Carl's words here. Many sources of the internal wave field have been proposed, but it has not yet been possible to make the kind of statement that we can make about surface waves. Namely, that when the wind blows, surface waves are generated. And the larger the fetch and duration, the larger the waves. So we, that was back in 1976, where Carl suggested that we look at perturbations to the spectrum instead of saying, get, enumerating all the cases in which we fit the spectrum or it looks consistent. It's the anomalies to the, spe to the spectrum are the, the really important thing. 
And so while we've made progress in understanding a lot of the energy inputs through wind and, and, and tidal uh, internal wave generation, and we've been able to look globally at dissipation processes, really the underlying physics that dictates the spectral form and energy cascade uh, is really elusive. And so maybe acoustics would have a, could give us some insight in this regard. And so, so what is kind of roughly known about the sources of internal tide or of the internal wave field? So we have the wind, right? The wind blowing on the surface of the ocean. It's been very well studied. There's the wind stresses and buoyancy fluxes. There's flow over uh, topography, giving rise to internal tides, which then kind of bleed out into the internal wave field. Uh, interaction with surface waves. I haven't really read much about this lately, although that was maybe a little more popular uh, in the 80s and 90s. And then extraction from the mean current, uh, where eddies could be involved in this, in this type of uh, uh, interaction, uh, sending energy into the internal wave field. And then, of course, sinks. We have dissipation of wave breaking, rough topography again, and continental boundaries. And so some compelling numbers here, I think, in terms of looking at those perturbations to the internal wave spectrum come about by kind of comparing the energy density and the dissipation rate. So we have this vertically integrated energy density for the internal wave field. The dissipation rate varies quite a bit. And so I just took a, a, an average number from uh, Waterhouse et al.'s recent uh, compilation of global measurements of dissipation. Uh, uh, this number here, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 watts per meter squared. So if you just divide the energy density by the dissipation rate, you get a relaxation time of about 40 days. So this is the interesting time scale over which you might see a perturbation to the spectrum evolve and have it sort of snap back into its, uh, into its equilibrium state. And so 40 days is a bit long if you're worried about tidal modulation. So there's the fortnightly modulation of the, t of the, of the internal tide input. Uh, uh, so that's you know, 14 days, a little bit short compared to this, but you know, this dissipation rate changes quite a bit. The energy density factors of two or three would not be uncommon uh, to see here in this, type of a, in this type of a problem. All right, and there's also the question of energy transfer within the, within the spectrum. So the traditional view has been that the spectrum is, is controlled by nonlinear wave-wave interactions. Uh, wave mean current interactions, but Rob Pinkles recently, or not so, quite so recently, maybe 10 years now, wrote about Doppler smearing, that essentially you get all the current variance from the inertial waves and you get all the displacement variance from the tides, and then those get Doppler smeared across the, uh, across the spectrum. So the assumption is he here is that the ocean spectrum is somewhat locally in e near equilibrium between forcing, radiation, dissipation, and energy transfer, but the details really have not been worked out. Okay, so a few community goals here. So it'd be interesting to know to what extent the GM spectrum represents an equilibrium or steady state solution to nonlinear interacting waves. And so Kurt Polzin has worked quite a bit on this and has some, uh, some solutions to uh, energy transport equations which show uh, perhaps the GM spectrum is, is an equilibrium uh, of these interacting waves, but we'd also like to know what extent Doppler smearing is, is affecting the spectrum. We'd like to know the relaxation rates of the spectrum due to perturbations from things like tides and eddies and uh, even annual cycle variations uh, in the internal wave spectrum. And then uh, kind of ultimately we'd like to know what is the flux through the spectrum going from from low to high frequency in wave number. And what I think acoustics can do, it can provide us maybe a little insight into this two and three category. So it's not detailed enough to look at fluxes. Uh, it's, it's not gonna look at individual nonlinear wave interactions, but it is gonna tell us how the spectrum varies with respect to perturbations. And so it's really because of, the, because of those, this temporal and spatial variability of the, of the spectrum will tell us something about the way it's responding to its uh, to perturbations. And so this is just a really nice example of showing how something can perturb the spectrum. So these are measurements of internal waves on the side of Feverling Seamount. And so to we have topographical effects now going in, changing the spectrum. So 
the, the different spectra here are from low in the water column to high in the water column. So you can see next to the slope, the spectrum is, is extremely modified by the topographic slope of the, of the seamount. So this is really like taking a sledgehammer to the, to the spectrum. But as you go up the water column, the spectrum slowly relaxes. And then by the top of the water column, you're seeing essentially a deep water spectrum of internal waves. So it's that adjustment of the spectrum going from topographically modified back to the equilibrium spectrum, I think is, is the interesting uh, question you would make, you would, you, you would try to address in, in measurements. But we like to look at how ocean processes are in fact changing these, uh, changing uh, the spectrum. And so internal wave tomography, why? Well, it's a sampling problem. We have a wide range of horizontal, vertical, and temporal scales. And so the acoustic met method gives us at least a different view into the variability at these different scales. So it's kind of a little bit the standard panoply of attributes of acoustic measurements. You get a spatial average. So in this case, you could actually get an acoustical measurement of the spectrum much more, you could get a stable estimate of the acoustical spectrum much more quickly because you're not only averaging in time, but you're averaging in space too. So you can see things settle down a little bit quicker. Uh, we have this wave number selectivity that I'll talk a little bit more about. So the perpendicular wave number residence. Uh, we have a rapid repeatable measurement. So in contrast to the Lagrangian measurements that whether you get a float or whether you don't have a float, we can repeat the measurement in one place. Uh, no calibration issues. Importantly, you, you could combine with tomog ocean acoustic tomography and other methods to estimate the large scale fields in which the internal waves are propagating in. So uh, questions like shear, background eddies, uh, perturbing influences uh, can be addressed there. And then you have this nice increase in the number of information with, as the number of moorings go up. So there are confounding issues. So there's stochastic sound speed structure that's not internal waves. Brian Dushaw showed us lots of spice. So uh, the acoustics really can't determine the spice from the internal waves too easily. So that would be a confounding issue. And the confounding issue is sort of one and two also. The attributes are also the, the liabilities. <laughs> and so, uh, so those are things we have to worry about. And then the inversion procedure is, is, is something else that's very, uh, it's a little tricky when you're outside the weak scattering regime. So the nice thing from you know, Walter's paper, the Munk and Zachariasen paper, is we have this thing called the perpendicular wave number resonance. And so it's sort of, uh, described basically by this cartoon over here. So we think of a plane wave coming in, there's an internal wave going perpendicular to, this, uh, to the rays of this plane wave, and it causes a corrugated front. And so we know that the rays are perpendicular to this correlated front, so we have a focusing region here, we have a defocusing region there, the phase variations are the, f are the, the wiggles in the front. Clearly if you turn in this thing 90 degrees, you're not going to get any, any uh, corrugation of the front. And so the really surprising thing about the resonance condition is that it throws away every single wave except for the ones that are perpendicular. And that has to do with the range being much larger than the correlation length of the random media. And so if we're just thinking of waves, prop if, if we're thinking of acoustic propagation in the X direction, you're only sensitive to the waves in the Y direction. And so that's a really nice way, that gives you a really nice selectivity in that it, then that you can look at the anisotropy of the internal wave field by transmitting in the north-south and east-west direction. And then the other neat thing too is that the dispersion relation then takes these perpendicular wave numbers and tells you what are the time scales of the acoustic field. So the dispersion relation will tell you the, that time scale. If you have any kind of Doppler smearing, um, that's kind of a different type of, of variation in time. And th this resonance condition is well measured uh, in the ocean. Many experiments over and over again have seen this, this resonance. So for example, this is a spectrum, an acoustical spectrum of the log amplitude as a function of frequency. And so we have one ray path uh, here with these dots. So this is a steep ray path. And up here we have a, a less steep ray path. And you can see the low frequency energy is depleted from this steep ray path because it's too steep to interact with the low frequency flat uh, internal waves, the inertial wave, near inertial waves. 
So this is showing this, 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 uh, this frequency selectivity due to the perpendicular wave number constraint. Another example, this is the MATE experiment off of uh, the Pacific Northwest. This is a phase spectrum. So we have the internal wave spectrum measured here, and then you have the phase spectrum measured here. And it turns out you get a factor, extra factor of frequency in the slope. And so the acoustic spectrum mirrors the ocean spectrum except for this, this uh, factor of sigma. And there's similar uh, and for vertical wave number spectra too. So instead of a kz to the minus two, it's kz to the minus three. So what, we're gonna, what we can do with the internal wave tomography problem is we can kind of take Munch and Wunsch as the starting place, right? So in the same way that you take measurements of travel time to get the sound speed, we can think of a path integral observer. So I'm thinking of actual path integral theory uh, for the different statistical measures of the acoustic field. And so we'll have some quantity g, and that there's going to be an integral of a ray path, and there's some quantity f that involves the spectrum. And you have to use many measures of different quantities g to get out the parameters of the spectrum. And so one kind of nice example is if you take the log of the coherence function, that gives you the phase structure function, and you can look at that as a function of, of time and depth and spatial lags to kind of constrain the, uh, the spectral estimate. The nice thing about Walter's work with Zachariasen in the weak fluctuation limit is that the acoustical spectrum, it's a, it's a line integral of a ray path of the internal wave spectrum in the perpendicular wave number constraint plus a diffractive term, this Fresnel filter. So if you can measure the acoustical spectrum and sort of deconvolve the Fresnel filter out of the, out of the measurement, then you get straight to the internal wave spectrum. And I think we could do, speaking of the future, I think we could do a, a, an exceptional experiment, kind of Worcester revisited 1977, uh, in which we do uh, transmissions over 100 kilometer, we're essentially making measurements over 100 by 100 kilometer box. So one kilohertz transmissions to vertical line arrays. So we do an east-west, north-south, east-west, north-south uh, transmission. Maybe I've flipped there in the center, looking at making measurements of the internal wave field. And so we ask the question, you know, can we balance, the, get an internal wave energy balance in this box? So we can, we can, pro we can look at the propagation in, the, in the, the anisotropic propagation conditions. We have paths along the edges that can look at the uh, inhomogeneity in of the internal wave field. And then this, of course, we'll do reciprocal transmissions, getting both U and zeta and quantifying uh, the momentum flux uh, along the different paths uh, of this, of this, of this uh, triangle or this uh, diamond. So I've looked at there's some really nice locations around Hawaii near the hot site. There's not lots of good perturbing influences there. There's eddies. There's internal tides. You can also go to the south of the islands. It would kind of be like maybe a, a second home experiment, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, so uh, so the, I think this would be a really nice experiment to, to carry out. And we've looked at a couple of calculations for uh, this region. But before I get too far close to my, my, my break time, I want to also talk a little bit about using an acoustical measure to, to measure things about turbulence. And we know David Farmer has done this quite a bit, and he's developed really very robust methods for, for measuring uh, the turbulence. So he uses a, a time delay technique in which you need to know the current to kind of translate your time information to a spatial uh, representation of the turbulence. But I think what we could do, if we could make a spatial measurement, we get, we're directly in the wave number domain, and we don't really have to worry about that, uh, that translation and knowing, the, knowing the, the velocity. So there's lots of good reasons to, uh, to want to know something about ocean mixing and turbulence. And so I'm going to propose a, a, a method that's uh, somewhat like what I, we talked about for the uh, internal waves. So the nice thing about turbulence is that it's a, it creates very weak temperature variations and very weak current uh, fluctuations. So from maybe a tenth of a milli-degree to one milli-degree, a tenth of a millimeter per second to one millimeter per second. And this is perfectly uh, suited for weak fluctuation theory, where you can apply the Munch and Zachariasen theory directly to, to the problem. And so 
Uh, it turns out it'll be a little bit easier to measure the, the envelope of the acoustical signal instead of the phase, because we, we're going to have to go to higher frequencies. And so I think the observable would be the spectrum of the log of the intensity uh, in terms of, we probably couldn't do it in two dimensions, maybe just do a vertical measurement. But so you have the log, the spectrum of log intensity as a function of the, the, y, the y wave number and the z wave number. As we showed before, it's an, it's an integral along a ray path, but if we're going to do a short distance, it's going to be essentially a straight line path. So we have the spectrum and the perpendicular wave number regime. Here's the Fresnel filter. And what it turns out, actually, even though we, I would propose to use hundreds of kilohertz uh, frequencies, the Fresnel zone is still much larger than the energy-containing energy scales of the turbulence. And so this Fresnel filter essentially is one. <laughs> the cosine term goes away when you do the integral over the ray path. And so the acoustical spectrum exactly mirrors the, the, the turbulence spectrum, uh, except for the turbulence spectrum is range average. So we're getting the range average of this, this quantity. And so just to uh, show kind of what a turbulence spectrum looks like here, so this is essentially the, the, the turbulence spectrum with a, a cutoff, a weak cutoff at small wave number. And if you impose a stronger cutoff at, at the low wave number, that's this term right here. And then there's a viscous cutoff uh, at larger wave number. And so there's three components. So this one kind of has the inertial range in it, and then these other two are, are really cutoffs. The important thing about the turbulence measurement is that you do have to simultaneously include both the effect of sound speed, temperature variation on the sound speed, and the velocity term. So this strength parameter, Cn squared here, is going to depend on both the thermal dissipation rate and the kinetic energy dissipation rate. So the first term is the sound speed term, the second term is the velocity term, and Farmer and Diorio worked uh, through all this. This worked beautifully, including both of these terms into the, into the, uh, the scattering equations. And, and again, it's the simple physics, that the moving media physics is the, is the simple one of the Monk, Zacharyson, and Worcester. An opposing current acts like a low velocity zone or a cold zone. A reinforcing current acts like a higher velocity zone. So if we just looking at one of the, this is just a turbulent spectrum, not the acoustic spectrum, but the acoustic spectrum will just sort of look uh, much, much like this. So this is for a value of, of chi of 10 to the minus 9th and epsilon uh, also 10 to the minus 9th. So that leads to a temperature variation of about 2 milladegrees C and a velocity variation RMS of about 2 millimeters per second. So here's our low wave number cutoff around 1 meter. And then we have the high wave number viscous cutoff uh, over maybe a few centimeters here on this side. And then here's our inertial range, k to the minus, the minus 5 thirds. And then if you look at the, the vertical spectrum of the acoustic, so if you integrate over the y wave number and you just have a vertical spectrum, so like the measurement we would make on a vertical array, we get these curves right here, the colored curves. And so instead of the 5 thirds slope, you get the eight-thirds slope right here, and that's the signature of the weak scattering limit. So this particular case, this is 400 kilohertz, 500 meter range, has a scintillation index of about 0.01, very small, about 0.4 dB uh, RMS uh, variation in the log intensity. And so the, the, the game that you have to play then now is that different frequencies and different ranges kind of allow you to explore different regions of chi epsilon space. So on the left here, this is a 500 meter range transmission. So what we do is we plot uh, chi on the x-axis and epsilon on the y-axis. And these different colors correspond to different frequencies. So for example, at 600 kilohertz, we have this curve here, which gives us the 3 dB cutoff, which is kind of the maximum that the weak fluctuation theory can handle. And then down here is a 0.1 dB RMS, which is maybe the lowest detection you could do. Uh, so we're going to need very sensitive hydrophones. We need a lot of decimal places on the, the measurement of the intensity. And so this gives us a regime of, of chi and epsilon space where we could make the measurement. And what's interesting, too, here is there's this dividing line between a place in which you're 
completely measuring epsilon, so this is U dominant, and then the place where you're measuring a combination of, of chi and epsilon, and that's the T dominant region. So, uh, you, so you, depending on where your interest is, uh, you can pick out different regions of, of this diagram and choose different, uh, you know, different parameters to try to, to, see, uh, to see the regimes that are most important. I, and looking at some of the, the papers, it seems as though actually this corner here is quite interesting, especially for the deep ocean. So sort of looking at smaller epsilon and smaller chi. And so that is going to require higher frequencies to explore. And so the experiment would really be just sort of a, a shrinking down of Peter Worcester's <laughs> experiment that we just talked about. So instead of doing a 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer, maybe do a 1 kilometer by 1 kilometer box. We want to put this in the deep ocean, maybe 200 or 2,000 meters above the bottom. The reason for that is that the mooring motion would be a little bit easier to handle down there. The things aren't swinging around so much in the upper ocean. And, and it's the same, uh, it's the same quantification of the variation in the spectrum. So we see anisotropy along the green pass, uh, inhomogeneity along the, along, the, uh, along the border pass, and so it's really going to come down to choosing these, this part of the parameter space, your frequencies and your range. Attenuation is a major factor. When you get to 600 kilohertz, things die off really quickly. <laughs> uh, but on the good side, you look at an ADCP uh, a standard ADCP at 100 kilohertz is 215 dB. So you've got a pretty high source level to start with, uh, and that helps quite a bit. And the ambient noise levels are quite a little bit lower, too, when you're at those higher frequencies. So just in conclusion, then, you know, small and microscale oceanography have, have the age-old sampling problem, and acoustical methods might be a nice way to kind of look at, at averages over certain regions. And certainly more analysis needs to be done to sort out a lot of the information content in the, in the observations, a lot of practical impl implementation problems. So all this really could be, could be rubbish, but it would be really great to make some of these measurements uh, if they really looked like they could pan out. And so we thank you, Walter, for planting all these little seedlings for us to kind of take up. And, uh, and we have lots of good things to do in the future. So thank you very much. scattering simulation system to look at turbulence back in the 80s. Uh, and, and what was the hang-up? And zooplankton and, zo and patchiness, which isn't in the theory. So somehow you have to uh, get Kelly to kind of strain the ocean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how much zooplankton is, is in the deep ocean? Well, So we sent our simulation system to David Farmer, and he ran it in the Fraser River outflow, where there's mm. this huge spice signal of fresh water going in the right. right. And that's where it, you know that's where the theory is. We're just uh, yeah, those are beautiful measurements. The river outflows into the deep sea. Uh, we have to uh, you know get Autech to really turn up all the baby noise out of this whole place. Out of there. <laughs> well, we don't want to perturb them that much. But it, it is always exciting because you can, anytime there's turbulence, you see the turbulence signatures coming You out. see the spectrum come out the way that, yeah. 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 So adding, and, I guess, the way to separate the biological signal from the Well, so then that's into bandwidth. Like, so when you, and Andoni's work too. So with bandwidth, you can separate out the biological signals from the, uh, from the turbulence. I'd just like to comment that as part of the deep ocean observing strategy project, we are considering adding ocean turbulence as what's called an essential ocean variable. So that might provide more motivation for developing this. OK, OK, very good. Well, let's thank John and all those morning students. Thank you. Thank you.